Okay, um, thank you, Daryl, for the introduction, and um, thank you very much for the in, um, invitation to this um, to this forum. And um, I'd like to welcome all the um, members of the audience, especially the um, students of the Asian Institute of um, Maritime Studies, and um, and uh, congratulations also, and thank you to um, Dr. Castro for the um, presentation that that preceded mine. Okay. Um, when I was given an invitation to give a 30-minute presentation about Philippine economic history, um, I was thinking about what theme I will focus on. Um, but definitely, um, I will have to make a have a focus on maritime transport. Okay, why? Because throughout economic history, um, maritime transport has been the invisible element. Okay, of Philippine trade and Philippine economic activity. Okay. In fact, um, if you look at your surroundings now, the clothes you're wearing, the laptops you're using, your cell phones, okay, um, the construction materials used for whatever dwelling you're staying at, okay, all the materials there, whether in its finished form or in its raw form, you know, traveled on a ship in one way or another. So um, this is how I'll be um, framing my presentation. Um, I'll try my best to give a linear narrative that is, you know, a narrative of Philippine economic history in chronological order, starting from the pre-colonial era up to the present. I will be discussing this within the context of external trade. And in some cases, I will give a description of the political environment because um, if you frame um, history around the political economy, you know, political institutions, matter as much as economic institutions as far as um, continuity and change in the Philippine economy is, is concerned, okay? Okay, um, this is a map of the um, Srivijayan Empire. Um, Dr. Castro mentioned earlier about the Austronesian influences, cultural influences in the Philippines. And it is through the um, trade network that centered around the Srivijayan Empire, which is, um, by the way, this is now present day Indonesia and Malaysia, and this is the Straits of Malacca right here. It is th through these um, networks that um, cultural influences from China and India went into the Philippines, you know, despite the fact that the Philippines, you can see the tip of Palawan here, it's not really part of the main network, okay? But nonetheless, it was um, 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 a feeder trade route, so to speak, for the um, um, main trade that took place in the Srivijayan Empire, okay? Which, um, um, which actually had a very strong navy, okay? But eventually, um, the Srivijayan Empire declined due to piracy and it was replaced by the Majapahit Empire which thrived in what is now present day Indonesia, that is until the establishments of the um, um, Muslim Sultanates. And it is through this um, network that, you know, we had concepts of Raha and Batala and even a system of writing, okay? So this is how um, the Austronesian culture of the Filipino people at the time became further enriched with outside influences. And of course, aside from cultural influences, you also had trade, okay, which um, entered through that network. And in this um, painting about pre-Hispanic Philippines by Randy Solon, you know, it's a mishmash of different elements of Philippine pre-colonial culture. Um, you can see um, the Panday Saputhao, okay, the blacksmith. You can see pottery. And of course, you can see traders with the Chinese traders here trading Philippine silk. Um, and the goods that were traded by Filipinos to the Chinese were usually forest products, kaya may usa dito, okay? And here you can see some of the traditional homes that Dr. Ed, uh, Castro described earlier. And if you look at the top here, of course, you have uh, um, what was then a typical Philippine watercraft at the time, right? Now, this is a um, representation from, uh, from Spanish sources of a caracoa. 
um, as you can see, it um, has the outriggers that Dr. Castro mentioned as typical in Filipino watercraft. And now the Kanako is actually um, it's actually a warship, okay, used for slave raiding um, across the Visayan Islands. Now, if I'm giving you a lecture about economic history, what does this have to do about warfare? Well, actually, the act of warfare itself is actually an economic activity because um, the purpose of slave raiding um, around the Visayas regions was actually to acquire slaves, which served as um, as um, as laborers. You know, sila mga naging uripon or um, or the, um, the commoners, so to speak, in pre-colonial um, Philippine society. Now, a more sophisticated network of slave raiding um, um, emanated from, from Sulu. Okay? In particular, the um, Samal Balangagi okay, um, from Sulu um, had a very sophisticated network of slave trading, which um, Southeast Asian historian James Warren describes as the Sulu zone, okay? And um, here you can see their um, slave raiding network, which extends across what is now present day Indonesia. In, and it actually made inroads well into the Visayas and Mindanao, even during the Spanish colonial, colonial period, okay? And um, um, for the Sultanate of Sulu, slave raiding was actually a very lucrative economic activity. There was a slave trade. They sold slaves, you know, around the different sultanates in what is now present-day Indonesia. And as we'll be discussing later on, one of those famous slaves was uh, Enrique of, Ma of Malucas. Okay. Um, now, um, these slaves were used in... Um, industries such as pearl diving and harvesting, but they also served as servants for the Muslim elites. And here you will see um, uh, a watercraft which they use, which does not have outriggers, okay, but um, has a net, uh, but is manned by oarsmen, okay. Um, this gave, uh, this gave um, this, the watercraft in combination with the sail, um, remarkable speed, you know, so it's very intimidating, actually, even for the Spaniards who were manning forts in colonial Philippines to, um, to see the raids of the um, Samal Balangagi or the Iranun, okay, who were, who was another um, well-known ethnic group um, who conducted slave raiding. Now, Outside of the Sulu zone, the traditional maritime heritage um, that was um, a part of the Visayan culture okay, was, um, was uh, basically cut off with the arrival of the Spaniards. As Dr. Castro mentioned earlier, the um, Spaniards created a system of pueblos in which uh, the encomenderos and the friar orders um, created a sense of social order within their colony and um, inter-island trade and external trade, you know, among uh, pre-colonial Filipinos practically stopped. But um, the Chinese trade with the Philippines did um, persist through the Manila-Acapulco galleon trade, right? Now, the Manila-Acapulco galleon trade was the, the main lifeline between the Philippines as a Spanish colony and Nueva España or New Spain, which was in Acapulco. Um, and the main trade goods on, on the Manila Acapulco Galleons was Chinese silk in exchange for Mexican silver, which was uh, the currency, which was uh, very much in demand in China at the time, all right? Um, so here you can see a Chinese junk, okay? Um, they usually deliver their goods to, um, to Manila in the uh, Parian quarters where the, the um, Chinese Sangle traders were residing and that's where they conducted their commerce with the Spanish colonizers in, in, in Tramuros. 
this is the root of the Manila Acapulco galleon trade. Okay, it was discovered by Fray Andres de Urdaneta while he was uh, in captivity in um, in the Moluccas. He observed the currents, um, and it was through this uh, northern route that the Spaniards were finally able to find the way back to Nueva España or the the seat of the vice royalty of um, Mexico here in Acapulco. Okay. Previously, whenever Spanish expeditions arrived in the Philippines, they tried to leave through the San Bernardino Strait, but they just ended up getting pushed down to the Malucas. No? So when Fray Andres de Ordaneta finally took the first voyage in 1565 to return to Acapulco, that's when the um, the um, constancy of return trips of the um, the galleons started. Now, of course, this was since this was the only connection that the Philippines had with Spain um, for for practically three centuries. It was also the only means of cultural exchange. Uh, so it was also through the um, galleon trade that you know um, certain elements of our, our culture, such as chocolate, coffee. Uh, tobacco, even um, even tomatoes, right, um, became part of our cultural heritage. Now, another, aside from the galleon trade, um, which was actually already in decline by the late 18th century, because by the late 18th century, uh, Spain was no longer monopolizing the um, the um, expansion of European empires into the Far East. So from the late 18th century onward, the Philippines needed another source of income. And it was through the tobacco monopoly that was completely managed by the colonial government that you know, the um, Philippines was successfully able to sell its first um, lucrative export commodity, right? But of course, as it turned out, tobacco was also consumed strongly by the local population. Now, through the um, cultivation of tobacco, a lot of provinces, especially in northern Luzon, developed. In fact, the province of Isabela was established because of the tobacco monopoly. Um, even up to now, um, tobacco is planted in the Ilocos region. And, it is, and of course, you don't just plant tobacco, you have to harvest it and transport it, and you have to process it into, into cigars. And that is the reason why Binondo became a very um, prosperous part of Manila during this period. Now, um, yes, the uh, Filipino shipbuilding tradition um, ceased during the um, Spanish period, but since tobacco was transported through the river systems, the Cagayan River and into the Pasig, okay? Okay, you can see in this uh, graphic here that the casco still being used, right? Now, as far as the tobacco monopoly is concerned, every part of the process was actually managed by the Spanish colonial government, except one aspect, water transport, okay? So, it is through water transport that a lot of um, Chinese actually were able to get into the water transport business during the period of the tobacco monopoly. Now, a major shift in Philippine trade um, with the outside world would take place after the galleon trade ended and after the um, Spanish Empire in South America began to collapse. When Mexico began became independent, the galleon trade ceased. And for the um, Philippine economy to prosper, okay, a new form of external trade was needed. And that took place when the Philippines finally entered the world market for export commodities following the opening of Manila to world trade in 1834. Prior to that, only Spanish ships had the exclusive right to enter Manila. But from 1834 onwards, you had British, American, 
um, French and even Danish steamships, well, steamships later on entering Manila Bay to trade. And, um, and what products were in high demand? Well, first of all, abaca became um, a commodity in high demand because of the need for cordage in, um, in the maritime industry, which was on the rise in, the, in Europe and the United States during the 19th century. And um, a British diplomat who came to the Philippines also developed the Iloilo Negros sugar economy. And um, from the time that Iloilo opened up to um, world trade in, in 1855 or so, okay, it also enriched, enriched the mestizo population of, of um, Iloilo, who up to now thrive as um, the descendants of the Senderos. Now, the colonial export economy was not exclusive to the Spanish period, right? It actually extended well into the period of American occupation. And two laws that were enacted by the US Congress practically paved the way for the, um, for the massive growth of um, the export of various agricultural goods with the United States practically as an exclusive trading partner. Okay? We have the Payne Aldrich Tariff Act in 1909, which provided free entry to the United States of all Filipino products except rice, sugar, and tobacco. And that was followed in 1913 by the Underwood Simmons Act, which removed all quotas on Philippine exports and to the United States, and likewise also for Philippine imports from the United States. So we had a total free trade relationship um, with America, which thrived well into the, into the um, pre-war years. In fact, by 1939, okay, 85% of all exports from the Philippines were going to the United States. And of course, with the growth of trade, you know, shipping always follows trade. Okay, trade is always produces an induced demand for shipping. Now, this type of ship is called a lorcha. Um, its design is actually the combination of um, European hull design, yung katawanya European style, but the design of the sails is based on the Chinese sampan, and this was um, used to transport sugar from, from uh, Negros to the port of Iloilo. And this was actually, this design was actually promoted by the British diplomat, um, Nicholas Loney. Um, and this is a scene um, in Manila, in the port, at the port of Manila, at the end of the 19th century. This is at the mouth of the Pasig River. This is where all the, um, so as you can see, you can see um, cascos and a variety of small watercraft, as well as larger steamers. Now, to give you an idea of the impact of the colonial trade on the, um, on the um, bottom line, the finances of the Philippines as a colony, from 1846, you can see how it grew, you know, up until 1920. And these were the products that were traded. We have abaca. This is a sugar central. And this is the production of copra. And eventually, <clears throat> the Philippines would also be exporting logs and mineral products. But during the American colonial period, the, um, the mineral product that was um, mainly mined was gold. You know? And since the gold was actually smelted, um, processed in Philippine gold mines, uh, it did not really could produce uh, an, induced, an induced demand for shipping, okay? Unlike copra, as you can see here, this is a postcard showing um, a steamer owned by Compania Maritima. Now, Compania Maritima was the biggest 
Philippine-owned liner company. It was formed in 1894, and um, it only went into decline during the late 70s, right? So it survived for almost 100 years. And in this postcard, aside from the passengers on deck, you can see that Copra is being prepared to be loaded, okay? In fact, the main demand for inter-island vessels was because of the copra trade. Um, there are actually a lot of narratives in which, you know, um, copra is actually part. Um, there isn't enough cargo space for loading copra that they actually had to load copra on the decks of the ships alongside, alongside the passengers. Okay, now this is uh, a more contemporary picture of, um, of the uh, port of Manila and the mouth of the Pasig River. These are some Compania Maritima steamers parked at the mouth of the Pasig. Now, why, why the mouth of the Pasig? Because during this time, there was still no North Harbor. The project for the development of the North Harbor would only begin in 1938. So during this time, um, up until then, all the domestic um, shipping traffic, okay, tried as much as possible to park alongside um, uh, at the mouth of the Pasig River. That is unlike the South Harbor, um, which was um, the docking area for, for foreign vessels. And here you can see um, the Empress liners, which were the biggest ocean liners at the time. Um, parked alongside the famous Pier 7, which gained a reputation as one of the best ports in the, um, in the Far East. Okay. And here, actually, you can see in the background um, the Manila Hotel and Luneta, and there's Intramuros. Okay, okay um, why am I showing you um, a uh, picture of Manuel El Quezon, right? Um, I would just like to emphasize that Manuel El Quezon is actually uh, more than just the image on your 20 peso note or 20 peso coin and more than the Amanang Wikang Pambansa, okay? Um, his role in creating Philippine economic institutions is um, very profound. Um, one of his um, first acts as president of the Philippine Commonwealth which was the transitory government um, from the American colonial period into the Philippine Independent Republic. Um, one of his um, first acts as uh, president of the Philippine Commonwealth was to um, create the National Economic Council, which um, had the responsibility of planning a post-independence Philippine economy, right? And among its members were Vicente Madrigal, and Ramon Fernandez, who happens, who happened to be the owner of Compania Maritima, the biggest liner company in the Philippines. Now, what am I driving at here? Okay, now as early as the time of Quezon, uh, you could see that um, um, personalities who were um, part of the business community were also having roles in government and by extension, it was very important to have close connections to the, to the president in order for your business to thrive. Now, one close associate of the president, of President Quezon, was um, Negros Ascendero and um, futures uh, and uh, Senator um, Esteban de la Rama, the owner of de la Rama Shipping. And because of his political position, and association, uh, he was given the privilege of purchasing brand new ships for ocean going trade, despite the fact that there was a very limited budget from the government, okay? And here I'm showing you a photograph of one of the four brand new ships that he purchased from Italy. This is the Doña Nati. Now the Doña Nati has, uh, actually has a very remarkable role in Philippine military history because during the Japanese invasion when the Japanese Navy blockaded the sea surrounding um, the Philippines at the start of the Second World War in the Philippines in 1942, 
the Doña Nati was only one of three ships that was able to break the blockade and deliver supplies to the Philippines at the start of the war. Okay. So with that feat of heroism, okay, De La Rama shipping would actually have the privilege of continuing this ocean going shipping venture after the war. Okay. Now, this is the port of Manila right after the Japanese occupation. And here it is occupied by US Navy vessels in August, 1945. And um, they were actually preparing to use the Philippines as a jump off point for the invasion of, of Japan. Okay, but that did not push through because of the um, use of the atomic bomb, which ended the war much earlier. In any case, soon after, okay, the Philippines, Philippine independence was recognized by the United States on July 4th, 1946. And since the Philippines was devastated by, by the damage caused by the war, okay, um, it was able to get support from the United States. Well, of course, in exchange for other unfair treaties um, through the Philippine Rehabilitation Act of 1946, and which provided $620 million, which is a very large amount at the time. And part of the Philippine Rehabilitation Act was the provision for the disposal of surplus property for commercial um, use. Now, this is a very significant uh, milestone in Philippine inter-island shipping because among those surplus properties that the US was disposing of were the freight and service or FS ships that were used by the US military and they were converted to mixed passenger and cargo use and because of the availability of these ships, okay, several companies were able to, um, to um, deploy their own inter-island fleet and challenge Compania Maritima. And I'm not sure if your generation is familiar with these brands, but I'm sure your parents are. This is the uh, logo of William Lines, Gotong Lines, and Aboiti Shipping. Okay? I'll, I think I have three minutes left, so I'll be rushing through the rest of my lecture. So this is a summary of, um, well, major turning points in Philippine economic history from the 1960s onwards. Um, now, the Philippines actually had the highest per capita GDP in Southeast Asia during the 1960s, but the plan of Carlos P. Garcia to create a Philippine industrial base failed. And that was, um, replaced by a regime of export promotion, which started during the time of just Dado Makapagal. And yes, there was continued growth until the time of President Marcos. But during the Marcos years onwards, take note that a lot of that growth had to be driven by debt. Okay. Um, so let me just give you um, a very brief, um, uh, uh, a single slide here to briefly explain the reality of the economic experience during the time of Marcos. Um, yes, um, there was massive government spending and a lot of exports in 1973, but that was very temporary because the only way that Marcos was able to sustain economic growth and development and the construction of infrastructure was through massive borrowing in which loans increased from 2.6 billion in 1975 to 25 billion by 1983. And look how the um, peso devalued during that time. Okay, there was also widespread crony capitalism. Crony capitalism meaning giving business, um, favorable business deals to, to your friends. And um, this was the context in which um, dubious personalities actually um, obtained ocean-going shipping assets, which proved to be very useless, okay? And this is also, and because of the economic difficulties, this is also the start of direct government support for the deployment of migrant labor, of course, including, including seafarers. 
Okay. Um, I just want to show you this slide to dispel the myth that the Philippines was um, the second uh, richest economy in Asia after Japan, because even in Southeast Asia during the martial law period, okay, um, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand, and even Indonesia were already ahead of us. Although in sa Indonesia magi iba iba yan, right? But throughout this period, Malaysia and Thailand were already ahead of us. Of course, you can give Singapore the excuse. Uh, also take note of the um, transformation in the in Philippine exports. Now, these were the traditional exports that started during the Spanish colonial period, and they were already declining because the Philippines was actually developing into a manufacturer of electronics and electronic equipment and garments. Okay? In fact, right now, our chief export is still electronic products, in case you, uh, in case you don't know. Now, unfortunately, one export that was promoted during the Marcos time, and I say unfortunately, is this item here, forest products, was the most massive deforestation of primary growth forests in the Philippines took place during his regime. And of course, um, logging also created an induced demand for shipping and um, I met the owner of Magsai Sai Shipping, and she's very proud of this picture because it shows a picture of one of Magsai Sai Shipping's um, bulk carriers carrying logs through Venice. Okay. Okay, let's go. Of course, um, here's the economic decline during the period of Marcos. And of course, nothing much happened during the time of Cory Aquino because you know it was her task to help the country get back on its feet after um, the decline of Philippine economy during the previous regime. And growth started to take place during the time of, Mark, uh, of Fidel Ramos because he actually liberalized the economy. As a result, manufacturing closed down due to poor competitiveness, um, but he allowed for the greater entry of foreign investment, okay? And because of the liberalization agenda of Fidel Ramos, there was actually a real threat that the business of William Lines, Gotham Lines, and Avoid Shipping would be threatened by foreign competition so in order to pool their capital and create a more powerful business entity, they merged into what was then WGNA. And they're, of course, famous for deploying the famous super ferry ships. Now, super ferry is not there anymore. Of course, you all know this as to go, which is now owned by the SM Investments Corporation. All right. So this single this single slide here also shows you the nature of philippine capitalism in which old companies with venerable traditions you know are actually just renamed and acquired by new capitalists without who never really created anything anything new you know but um but of course um when we talk about the shipping industry, we don't only talk about ships and we don't only talk about capital. We don't only talk about trade. We also talk about manpower. Okay? And of course, um, at the entrance of the museum, I think there's a statue of Enrique de Malaca, okay? who was the um, seafarer who accompanied Magellan on his expedition to the Philippines and assisted in translating Visayan languages. right? Um, we would like to believe that he actually came from one of the Visayan islands, although new research from using primary sources actually, um, um, actually points to the fact that he might have come elsewhere from what is now present day Indonesia. But regardless of where Enrique de Malaca was really from, okay, there's no denying you know, the contribution of the Filipino seafarer to the um, Philippine economy. Okay. 380,000 Filipino mariners made up a quarter of merchant shipping crews in 2019. 
and remitted six billion dollars in 2018. Okay. Um, now, unfortunately, um, we could not rest on this, this reality because China actually recently knocked the Philippines from the top spot as the biggest single source of seafarers in the world. And the deployment of Filipino mariners is actually falling, of course, especially due to the, the COVID pandemic. But of course, if you look further into the future, okay, beyond, beyond the ships, beyond the human capital, right? Okay, trade will always take place. Okay, these are the major trade routes in the world. And just imagine in all of these trade routes, okay, a Filipino seafarer has the responsibility of ensuring that the ship carrying the goods around the world, you know, reaches its destination. But then again, probably during our lifetimes, this reality could change. Very recently, I came across this article in on CNN and you know and I've actually watched a few videos now this is um, a crewless cargo ship which is operated using artificial intelligence and um, uh, I think they're going to be um, sailing this somewhere in, in Norway and um, of course, According to economic historian Joel Mokir, technological change also has a very huge role in, in the um, development of, of world economies. And this is probably one reality which the Philippines would have to get used to. So fortunately, um, if um, the Philippines also has a very large pool of talent as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. And just as we have did, done from the pre-colonial times that were discussed by Dr. Castro earlier, of course, we would be able to adapt to these conditions. And with that, I end my presentation. Um, and uh, thank you very much.